I remember when I was just 12 years old, waking up in the middle of the night because I heard screaming coming from the hallway. When I opened my bedroom door, what I saw was my dad pressing a knife up against my mom's throat, threatening to end her life if she, my sister, and I didn't leave the house that night. Now, eventually we got him to stop and put the knife down and go to bed. And I don't remember exactly what words were exchanged that night, but what I do remember very clearly was that I could tell my dad had been drinking that night. Now, I think this is a much more common phenomenon than what most of you realize. I mean, think about the last time you were at a party, and you probably saw someone there who had a little bit too much to drink. They might have gotten a little loud, a little aggressive, or maybe even violent. Well, it turns out that this behavior, alcohol-induced aggression, is a much more widespread phenomenon than what most people realize. And in the US alone, 40% of violent offenders admit to being intoxicated during the time of the crime, which is so substantial. And this includes violent offenses such as assault, rape, and even murder. And to have to deal with those 40% of individuals that do get incarcerated, it costs the United States roughly $18.6 billion a year. That's billion with a B. And just to put that number into perspective, that's roughly $2.6 billion shy of NASA's yearly budget, or it's enough to buy half of everybody in Texas an iPhone X. <laughs> so if this is such a devastating problem, is anyone doing anything to stop this? I mean, can we do anything to stop this? Well, as a neuroscientist, the way that I would answer this question is by saying, uh, is by asking, what are the building blocks of this behavior? More specifically, what are the genes and neurons that are contributing to making a person become more violent after they consume alcohol? So it's not really well known what exactly causes alcohol-induced aggression. And we're in a pretty tight spot here because it's a pretty tricky behavior to study, especially in humans. I mean, think about the kind of experiment that you would have to do at its most basic level, right? So say you got 100 volunteers to agree to be this experiment. What you would do is give them a shot of whiskey, bottle of beer, and then say, OK, so in about five seconds, there's going to be someone else who's also had a drink. He's going to come through that door, and he may or may not want to try to kick your butt. <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't really want to volunteer for that, especially because I don't really have any upper body strength. <laughs> but this is also highlighting a fact that there's very complicated sort of ethical implications that are involved with doing human research where humans are acting aggressively towards each other. And not only that, even if we could get the study funded, what would the results look like? Well, humans are extremely diverse. They're diverse in their drinking habits, they're diverse in their lifestyles, and they're also diverse in their genetic makeup. And this is also underscored by the fact that not everybody in the population becomes violent after consuming alcohol. Some people, in fact, use alcohol as an excuse to become violent. And there's also those that don't really need alcohol to be aggressive. <laughs> and so if this is such a tricky behavior to understand in humans, and such a devastating behavior that affects all of us, is there anything that we can use to study this? Well, what I'm going to propose is we use the common fruit fly or Drosophila melanogaster. And some of you guys might be thinking, oh god, this girl's going to talk about flies. <laughs> well, in the next few slides, I will have hopefully convinced you of why I think this is a good model organism for studying this behavior. So some of you might be also thinking, wait a second, do fruit flies even get drunk? So I'm about to show you a video. And what you're looking at right here is a fly just kind of putzing around in his vial. And at the top, you see a straw that's delivering alcohol vapor into the vial. And after seven minutes in that alcohol vapor, what you can see is that the fly's moving around a lot more sluggishly. He's losing postural control. He's kind of stumbling about, still cleaning himself. And uh, after five more minutes inside of that alcohol vapor, what you also see is he's moving around even slower until he falls back down and he can't get back up. So this looks pretty familiar, right? I mean, kind of sounds like us. <laughs> <laughs> And so basic answer is yes, flies can get drunk. Well, not only that, but flies also share 75% of disease-causing genes with humans, which is very substantial. 
And it tells us if we study something in flies, we can likely translate this result into humans. And flies also have a lot of readily cheap available transgenic lines that we can use. Flies also have a very short lifespan, which means we can do a lot more experiments in a shorter period of time. And finally, flies also share a natural relationship with alcohol, where you've probably seen a bunch of flies just kind of aggregated on like a pa patch of rotting fruit. Well, that piece of rotting fruit has ethanol on it or alcohol. And what that means is that flies have evolved a lot of shared alcohol behaviors. For instance, they can acquire tolerance to alcohol. They can also show signs and symptoms of withdrawal. And they can also seek alcohol despite negative consequence. So, Going back to the original question, can we use flies as a model to look at alcohol-induced aggression? Well, it turns out that people have been studying fly aggression for a very long time. And especially in the past decade, it's been studied quite extensively. And the way that it's been classically modeled is by looking at this fly aggression chamber. And so what you see here are two male flies just kind of duking it out with each other. And on the center, you see a goldenish kind of blob. Well, that's fly food. And on top of the fly food, you see a decapitated female. And she's decapitated because we don't want her to move from the food patch, and she's there because she brings all the boys to the yard. <laughs> okay, and so this video might be a little bit too fast for the untrained eye, so I'm just going to show you one quick move that's a pretty robust move that flies often engage in called the lunge. And so you can see in here the lunge is in slow motion. The fly is rearing up on its hind legs and just slamming down on uh, the unsuspecting opponent. And it can be pretty devastating if you're on the receiving end of the lunge, if you're a fly. All right, so what our lab did was we took this uh, very classical model of looking at fly aggression, and we asked ourselves, do flies become more aggressive after consuming alcohol? And the re results were pretty surprising. So on the left-hand side, what you're looking at is a video of two sober flies fighting in that same kind of aggression chamber. And so you can see that the fight is very short-lived, and there's a very clear winner and loser. And the winner is the guy that stays on the food patch. So, when we take a look at the intoxicated flies, what we see is something entirely different. And you can see that both of these flies are fighting on that same food patch, except basically not any of them are letting up. There is no clear winner or loser at this point, and they're just really going at it with each other. And so I think we can all agree that there's obviously a difference between how these sober flies fight and how these intoxicated flies fight. So we... We took a look at the data by uh, hand analyzing all of these videos, and it was probably on the order of like 200 hours of videos that we all had to analyze. And what we found was uh, something quite striking. Uh, we found that the intoxicated flies spent a greater, significantly greater amount of time fighting than the sober flies did. Neat, right? <laughs> so, okay, why should we care that a couple of drunk flies are getting more aggressive with each other, right? What does this mean for us humans, right? Come on, what can we get out of this? Well, going back to the original problem that it's very difficult for us to be able to study this behavior in humans because of the methodological, ethical, and diverse complica um, complications. Well, why can't we use fruit flies as a model organism? And it's especially relevant because humans have so many genes. Humans have 20,000 protein coding genes. That's a lot of genes. Well, not all of them are going to be involved in regulating alcohol-induced aggression. In fact, only a very small subset of them. So how can we understand what is relevant? What does contribute to this behavior? Well, I'm going to take you through a very common strategy called a forward genetic screen. And the forward genetic screen will allow us to identify these gene targets, extend these results from flies to rodent models, such as mice and rats, and then eventually extend these results into humans as well. So, First, what you would have to do in a forward genetic screen in flies is you would take a collection of mutants, and each of these mutants has a single unique mutation in a gene such as a dopamine receptor, an actin binding protein, or a transcription factor. And that's okay if you guys don't know what that is. Um, and so what you do is you test all of these mutants for that behavior to look to see whether or not they can acquire alcohol-induced aggression. And more specifically, what you're looking at is the animals that didn't acquire alcohol-induced aggression because what that means is the gene that they have uh, mutation in probably affects this behavior. And so we would take these flies and look at what mutations they have and eventually pick out the same kinds of mutations and in uh, rats and mice as well. And then we would perform the same set of experiments in rats and mice and eventually be able to pinpoint in the human genome 
which genes are of interest to us. Okay, so you're probably thinking this girl's talking a lot about genes, right? <laughs> well, genes are super important because they, uh, some of them code for proteins. And what we can do is develop drugs against these proteins to either enhance or inhibit their activity, effectively changing the behavior that they're involved with as well. And so what if we could find these genes and develop a drug against them? Well, what we would be able to do is make this drug, give it to someone, and whereas they would normally become a violent drunk, because they took these pills, they would just be a happy drunk, right? <laughs> And so some of you might be thinking, well, can't we just get these guys to stop drinking? Well, it turns out that this is a much more difficult problem to solve. And I think this statistic perfectly highlights how difficult it is to solve, where 90% of alcoholics relapse within the first four years of treatment. I mean, that's pretty bad, right? And this includes treatments such as drug therapies like naltrexone or non-drug therapies like Alcoholics Anonymous or counseling. So it's a very difficult problem to solve, and at the root of this disease is alcoholism, but one of the major symptoms of this disease is alcohol-induced violence. So it probably would just be good enough to find a way to treat a symptom of this disease to understand how we can stop it and save all those future victims of alcohol-induced violence and save the United States those billions and billions of dollars and prevent those people from even being incarcerated in the first place. And ideally what would happen is this drug would be available to everybody. Your mom, your sister, your fraternity brother. <laughs> and so you could take this drug preemptively even if you uh, don't necessarily have a history of alcoholism either. And so this can only really be possible within our lifetimes if we move forward with this forward genetic screen by performing these experiments in flies. And so what I wanna end my talk with is by saying that it's not always the most obvious strategy that gets you the correct answers. Sometimes, in fact, the most obvious strategies fail. And then that's when you have to take the unconventional route, the creative one, to try to understand the root of this behavior. And so what I argue is that if we can unfly on fly violence, we can somehow understand how to end human alcohol-induced violence as well. Thank you.